when I think that I have to surrender myself to society, it's like being put in a grave. I feel that I have to die. So the individuation of the individual was for him to save the liberty and grace. But at the other end of it, an individualism which will destroy the fabric of society and which in fact will not, not go on in an unbridled fashion was also seen by many to be uh, obvious, an obvious fact, and debates were carried back and forth. And it was by the grace of God on my return to my own tradition that I was able to transcend this uh, football game that was being played back and forth, if I can say so, between the two sides. And I was able to, by reading the classical text and by going beyond what certain people had said, all oh, not all, there are some Orientalists, especially the that Hamilton Gibb was one of the exceptional Western Orientalists, in fact, who realized that the Islamic way of looking at the individual and society was not based on the polarization between the two, but it was quite something else. Anyway, I was able to come back to a, a humble understanding uh, what the Islamic view is on these two subjects and how they relate to each other. Of course, this is key for the understanding of social life, of political life, economic life, the whole external aspect of, of Islam and Islamic civilization is a very, very key and crucial matter. And in the lecture of an hour, I cannot get to every aspect of it. But I want to emphasize certain salient and very important features. Let me start with law. Law. As you know, uh, all uh, this audience consists of either uh, Muslim scholars or scholars of Islam, I don't think anyone who is, has no knowledge whatsoever in Islam is here. So I presume a certain amount of basic knowledge, uh, not too much, but a certain amount of it. But uh, think of law. Uh, of course, whenever we think of the word law in English or in Latin, like uh, we think of, of course, society, but we also think of the law that governs the individual. And the two, although in our mind, are not always related, in reality they, they are related. If driving fast is the law that protects society, it's the law that also governs over my behavior when I'm sitting behind the wheel of a car and getting the secret cameras that make money for Washington, D.C. by penalizing us left and right with uh, tickets that are more than the income of somebody who went off for one month. But uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the law of society and law of story and the individual, of course, are interrelated. But uh, Islam looks at part of this in a somewhat different way. First of all, what is the word for law in Islam? There are, in fact, two different words, two different words which became intertwined although they began from very different origins. One is the Arabic word as sharia which would translate as divine law. From the root shara'a, that is the road, avenue, path, uh, and as sharia or asha, which could, could be that form, means divine law. And ultimately, the only law that is binding upon a Muslim as a Muslim, which is that's also a very problematic question because some laws in Islamic society, even from modern times, were not Sharia -like laws. And what status they had is another question that was discussed by legal authorities in the Islamic world for over a thousand years. I'll just would say one second by very soon. The second word, the second word is the word of Arnon. The word of Arnon in Arabic comes from the Arab. Greek word canon, from which which is related to the English word canon. And the word canon and qanun, canon law in the Catholic Church, and qanun have the same etymological root, but with opposite meanings, paradoxically. Because in Christianity, canon law means the law of religion or the church. Whereas qanun in Islam means non sharia law. Non sharia law. But nevertheless, something which exists. And great uh, Ottoman Sultan was called Banuni, uh, so I want to know it It was a great title. It, it took pride in it. It didn't say, oh, this is against the Sharia, against Islam. Banuni itself was totally integrated into Islamic perspective. And the Ulama himself accepted the fact, this is a very important point, that 
where there is no clear injunction of the Sharia, which in principle should encompass the whole of life, but in practice does not cover everything as something which it leaves outside out of its purview, then the Qanun that is there in terms of society should be accepted from the point of the Sharia. This is a mouthful I just said, but let me give you an example. The Sharia has nothing to say about stopping at the red light. In none of the classic books of the Sharia, there is a chapter on stopping at red light. But red light is part of the unknown law of the society in which we live. The society in which we live in a non-Islamic society, if the law does not go against the Sharia, then one must follow it as part of one Sharia duty. So to stop at the red light, is in direct and Islamic duty. Of course, most Muslims don't listen to this and have not done so for the last 1300 years. It's very interesting. From the beginning of Islam, people who would go willingly pay their zakat. But it was considered to be very unmanly to be taxed according to the Qanun without being whipped a few times. Nobody would pay. You realize like some of these nice Americans you know, put their money on islands off the shores and you want to pay the taxes here. There were a lot of people that are tax evaders, and the attitude towards Qanun uh, was very, very different. But according to Islamic law, what I said to you is the view of most of the Jews, Sunni and Shiite alike. So you had in the traditional Islamic world an idea of law, which, the heart of which came from God, the mind law. But also God had given us intelligence, the view of the society, of course, all the other sources of Islamic law, Ijma, Riyas, and so forth, and other way to that. And laws which, in fact, the Quran does not speak about, but which are necessary in human society, and which should be in, done in harmony or followed in harmony with the Sharia, what the Quran says. And the fact that the Sharia was always a living reality from the very, very beginning. Uh, and it was not a dead tree, as many people have made it. It was a living tree. I grew new branches. But it was always an interaction with our normal, with the situation that came up, and for which the uh, governments, even before modern times, uh, which were sultanates or monarchies or caliphates or whatever they were, had to make laws. There's a very interesting instance of that. When the Arab armies reached Khorasan, uh, they discovered in Khorasan a wonderful Persian melon, a long one like this, which is so delicate it doesn't come to the United States. You find it in London, I guess, as far as London. One of the great fruits of the world, whatever fruit that grows in Iran, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Greater Khorasan. And the Arab ruler was astounded by this incredible fruit. And it was expensive even at that time. And so he wanted to put taxes on it. We want to collect taxes, like, and so there was no guidance what to do. He wrote to the caliph. He wrote to the caliph that there is wonderful fruit here, and uh, we don't know what to do with the taxation. There's no nothing in Islamic law, no uh, Islamic law. Sharia had not been codified in Sharia then, but there was the example of the Prophet and Salah Salam in Medina and the early Islamic community already had an uncodified Sharia by which the judges, in fact, judge people at court in the first century uh, of the Hijra. We know that. So he writes with the caliph, what do we do? And he said that uh, the story of it had was that during the caliphate of Omar when the Arabs conquered Persia, whether it was that or somewhat later, anyway, the caliph looked at all the precedents, didn't find any. And he said there's no precedence in Christ of the Prophet, nothing in prophetic hadith, collect the taxes as it was done before Islam came to Khorasan. And this itself will be the law of the land, the Islamic law, in the sense of Qanun complementing the Sharia. Now, I've made all this uh, introduction for this point. It's not a lecture on Islamic law. I'm not a special Islamic law, but I've made all this introduction for this point that I want to get to. As Muslims have always seen it, uh, the law pertains to a unit which itself is a sacred unit. That is, Islamic law and the Qanun, which all became on the outside, was integrated with 
the Sharia was seen by Muslims as pertaining to a recipient who had a sacred nature. This is very, very sacred. My mother keeps a sacred nature, I will tell you. It was either the individual created by God, Khalifa Allah fell out, and with immortal soul, here on a journey to eternity, all of the conditions which are central to the understanding of the Islamic message. Or the community, which was viewed, of course, not as an aggregate of individuals, but as the Ummah. It's extremely significant to understand the Ummah. I know everybody uses it, even the word Ummatic has entered into English. My late friend, Ibrahim al-Farouk, al Farouk, was massacred, killed in Philadelphia a few years back in a great tragedy for the Islamic world. Uh, he always used the word traumatic, and that was his favorite word. So Ismail would stop bringing these Arabic words into English, but I'm myself very conservative in coining words. Uh, I don't know that I'm coining one word in the Persian language, the word for tradition, sonat, which is caught on and I was used every other day in all the papers, but I usually try to avoid that. But he wanted to use that word. So you know, all know the word traumatic, where he talks about it, the song of the world of his present time in history, always talks about the Ummah, but does nothing about the Ummah. Uh, this is a very strange period of our history, but the idea is extremely central and important. The idea was that the society is not simply the sum of individuals. The forest is not simply the sum of the trees. And here is where Islam went against this idea of ex extreme individualism, in which society was nothing but the sum of individuals, and what was important was the freedom of the individual, the rights of the individual, uh, what a property of the individual, and so on and so on. Because the Ummah was created by God, and Islamic thought has always looked upon all societies as Ummahs, and has analyzed social aggregates, humanities, various collectivities, human collectivities, as the ummahs of various prophets. And especially since dealt most of all with the Abrahamic world, you always talk in Arabic and Persian and Turkish other Islamic languages about the Ummah Muhammadiyah, Ummah Isawiyah, Ummah Musawiyah, and all the old tribes of Israel as Ummah Nuriyah, Ibrahimiyah, this is very famous in Arabic. Uh, in the, uh, many, many words. And even this was extended when Islam went to India and China beyond the boundaries of the Zoroastrian, excuse me, the Abrahamic world or the Persian, which was the world of Zoroastrian and Achaean religions. The idea that people, uh, communities are defined by the laws given to them by God, not by ethnicity not by race, not by geography, these are all secondary and irrelevant, but by their attachment to a particular form of divine law or revelation. That itself changed the whole status of racism in Islam, of race and ethnicity. It was totally secondary. Totally secondary. During the Ottoman period, for example, the Christians were living in Turkey, which is as Turkish as the Muslim Turks. But they're seen as being the Umma of Sayyidina Isa. And that's why they have their own laws in certain matters. They have their own laws in certain matters. Now, this idea of a sacred community, and I will not now talk about, I will not talk about comparative religion, other communities, let's stick to the slide. I can't cover everything one night, but this point is important to know. This view of society as Umma. Therefore, connected the law of God and the law of society in such a way that neither one would destroy the other or smother the other. The individual had to respect the law of the Ummah. But the Ummah also had to respect the law of the individual. This whole battle that we see, as I said, in 19th century European thought, European philosophy, political philosophy, especially between English and uh, French and German, these three countries, thinkers, very important thinkers. Even going back 
to how the law can be more classical in those thinkers, uh, and which can be the only same debate between Hamilton and Jefferson and all of these things. This was totally absent in the song. We didn't think in these categories. That is because the relation between the individual and society was seen in terms of a divine law built by God from both individual and society. Let me give you a concrete example. During the month of Ramadan, according to Islamic law, an individual, even sick and permitted by Islamic law not to fast, should not be pretentious and show off in public that he's eating or she's eating. That he should not break the norm for the community. The community, on the other hand, has no right to impose fasting upon the individual if the laws for the individual, because he's sick, tell him that he does not need to fast. This is a very, very important dynamic. I'm not saying the law was worked in Islamic history. Some governments came to military government and tried to pressure and force things upon individuals, and all kinds of things happened. Many individuals did not listen to uh, what the rights of society. But there was this reciprocity of human responsibility, human rights. And human rights, independent of the rights of society, were considered to be meaningless. And in fact, if you look upon it like this, you have to review completely the whole discussion of rights and responsibilities in the Islamic context. In the Islamic context, we have three responsibilities. God, to ourselves, to the other. And the other includes not only society, human society, but all of God's creation, which the Quran calls ummas, the species of ants, or spiders, or elephants, are ummas for God. It's very, very interesting. It's seen as sacred societies. The word umma is not only for human beings in the Quran. Several times, several sources. So you had this relationship in, uh, between man or woman, man, or man or man and son, man and woman, I don't mean gradual, I don't mean male, of course, I mean human being, had responsibility towards God, responsibility towards himself, responsibility towards the other. Let's put aside the world of nature for the moment and just consider the social other. And from these responsibilities grew rights. In Islam, responsibility always comes before rights. I've written somewhere, in fact more than once I've said this, look at the word responsible, uh, it's analysis. Uh, it means there's something out there to which you respond. There has to be, first of all, something to which we are responsible. The rest, re, the prefix re in Latin implies a like word return. Uh, something goes back to something else. And uh, from the Islamic point of view, we and God are not equal. God has created us, owe our existence to him, and it's he who calls upon us. And our very existence is an answer to his call. And therefore, being comes from God, responsibility comes from us. We have absolutely no rights of our own independent of God. Because we don't have any power of our own being independent of God. This Western idea of human rights in a purely secularist fashion means nothing in the Islamic context. There might be in the 22nd century so many Muslims who become secularized, like Christians who become secularized, who talk in these terms. I'm not talking about the future. Even today in the Islamic world, the number of people who talk about, who and even understand human rights in the, independent of God's rights and responsibility we have towards God are very few. They might come on CNN every night and get paid and become offered professors. That's irrelevant, totally irrelevant. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Anyone today in the Islamic world who 
refresh that song, this immediately a uh, green card and I found a Harvard professor who was in Chicago uh, in 24 hours, uh, being a bit facetious and angry at this uh, cynicism that is going on amidst us. But in serious fashion, in serious fashion, uh, the human being, the human being, uh, by virtue of who he or she is, owes his or her existence to God. And our rights are given to us by God by virtue of fulfilling our responsibilities defined by God through the revelation of His laws. How do we know how? How do we responsibility have? According to Islam, God has let us know through the Prophet and through the revelation through the Quran and the Hadith and so on and so on and get into it. So, when we talk about individual society, uh, first of all, of the law, we must remember that Islamic law complements human existence at the individual level and in the social aggregate. Each has its own duties, its own rights. Man cannot break the laws of society. Society cannot be aggressive against the rights of the individuals given by God. And from this came a remarkable equilibrium, which classical Islamic thought prevented what happened in the West from the 19th century onward. There's a kind of totalitarianism which based itself on the primacy of society and uh, excessive liberalism, which led, in fact, to dissolution and even revolution in a certain sense. And the profound reason that Islam did not produce is Karl Marx and Lenin's and theoreticians and the Nazi party <coughs> this totalitarian view of looking at society as the ultimate reality resulting in the West in an extremely leftist form in communism, extremely rightist form in Nazism was not only on the left the fact that this phenomenon never occurred in the Islam what's the question ask why? why were neither Stalin nor Lenin nor Hitler born in an Islamic country? We certainly have many bad dictators, many ruthless people who had a share of people as bad as them on a smaller scale, but theoretically, ideologically, because this dichotomy could not have come into existence in the traditional way that Islam looked upon the relationship between society and the individual. Now, let me come to the second point, the question of ethics. I have so far spoken about law. <coughs> ethics. Again, in Islam, uh, ethics involves the individual, ethics involves society at large. Society cannot act as one being ethically. It's actually to judge ethical according to norms which are set in that society. Society is not a single conscious person. Uh, there's a big debate that goes on in Islam, which also exists in Judaism, whether a collectivity as a whole is responsible for ethical action or not. And whether God uh, punishes a collectivity as a whole if most of its members or some of its members do evil. It's a very important uh, religious and ethical debate which you find also in Christianity, but especially in Judaism. And in Islam, where the question of the sin of the forefathers, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, is was so important. You're going to have to pay for your father's sin. Why am I responsible? Uh, this is, this is the deep theological issues. Of course, I cannot get into them again in depth, but I can say a word about them. Uh, it's, you can even say one word in, which is deep, then I have to go to a long explanation of everything. But let me just uh, mention this. Uh, God judges us as individuals. We are responsible for God as individuals. And He sent us an ethics whereby to live. According to Islamic law and Islamic ethics and Islamic theology, we are not responsible for the sin of our neighbors. We are not even responsible for the sin of our own wives and daughters and sons and fathers and mothers. And they have judgment, we are only asked about their actions. There are so many verses of the Bible, a 
eschatological verses in which human beings are always said they are responsible for their own actions. We are not responsible for actions of others. However, the however is the part is difficult, difficult, difficult. We live by virtue of certain support systems which society affords us. If we lived the, our whole life in a cave and there was a fig tree outside of the cave that fed us figs 12 months a year and spring were by to drink and never met another human being, this however <coughs> would not arise. But the however does arise because we interact. And the question comes up, to what extent are we responsible for others? And the saying that Christ am I my brother's keeper. Here there are both positive and negative elements in Islamic ethics. We must help others as much as we can. We said as much as the Christian teaching as Islamic teaching as that of any any religion series. No religion can be without charity. But am I only responsible for other people's wrongdoings? Over this issue. I do not want to fool you. Truthfully, there has been a great deal of disagreement among the ulama and scholars of Islam over the centuries. You all know the famous principle, al-amr al-ma'ruf wa na'ar al-ma'ruf. That is to command what is good and to try to dissuade what it, the people from what is evil or what is forbidden. Some schools of Islamic law include this as part of the credit of, of, of faith. Some say no, this is mustaha, it's recommended, but it's not required. That is, am I as a Muslim required if somebody in the street is saying something wrong to stop and correct it? Or am I required if somebody is stealing from uh, the shop as I'm passing by? To stop and prevent from doing so. Won't he shoot me? Uh, this is, of course, a question we have, which is universal. You've seen people in New York being murdered or people walk by. You've seen in other states people putting their own lives at stake to save their neighbor. You, you just saw this last week, both of these occurred in the United States. And it's not Islamic law, it's a universal human predicament. But in the case of Islam, this is always a difficult question to answer. Uh, to what extent, I as an individual, am I responsible for the ethics of society? Uh, we know that in the Quran there are examples of Roman roots and uh, people of Lot and people of Thamud and other peoples who were punished collectively for their evil, not individually, except the few who were mutaqeen, who were reverent towards God, were saved. Uh, we don't have several stories in the, in the Quran, sort of Nam, but the surahs of the Babas. We, those of you who know the Quran know that well. Uh, the question is, to what degree was corruption, moral corruption, and evil prevalent in that society that everybody caught fire? There's a wonderful Persian saying that says, when fire comes, wet and dry wood burn together. Uh, there are few Persian audience that start this stuff, but I said. Uh, now, uh, is this true? It will happen to, will happen to God's justice? These are very, very difficult questions. Uh, and if anyone tells you that we give you a definitive answer, it's usually an answer which satisfies certain things and doesn't satisfy other things. And I, for one, have many people ask me about this. Always say we have to leave this to God's wisdom and God's mercy and God's justice. But He has held us responsible for trying to guide people who are doing evil towards what we believe to be the good. If they don't listen, it's their responsibility. So, as a result of this, again over the centuries, as a result of the application of Islamic law and in Islam, ethics. Is related to divine law. In America or the West, ethics and law are not that closely related. Something the law is the law, and it seems to be ethically bad. The law is the law. 
In Islam, what if you ask, what is the source of Islam, uh, Islamic ethics? Akhlaq comes from the Quran and Hadith, which are also the source of divine law, and they're interrelated. Definitely they're interrelated. Now, in society, uh, as a result of the application of the Sharia, secondly, as a result of following the Sunnah of the Prophet, by people over the ages, who was actually the most important model for Islamic ethics, because the teaching of the Quran about ethics need the human model to follow. Uh, the Quran talks about it, the Prophet, the Prophet lived it. And since we are a lot of human beings, the living part helps us so much. So the Prophet is always the speaker in a living fashion for the verse of the Quran, of course, and switching the question of ethics. So, as a result of this application, there was built up in society a remarkable regard for social ethics, which was not completely individual. Let me give you an example. No Islamic society had lived without thieves. The only thieves are only in New York or Washington uh, or uh, the churches in Wisconsin. I don't know thieves in Wisconsin, but anyway, they're all over the world. And in our part of the world, it's mostly pity thieves. Uh, Wall Street thieves are not found in the Islamic world, it's not yet. But there's a case in Iran which is getting close, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I think you know what I'm talking about, but they'll be following you. Uh, things which got some zeros you can't read anymore. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what's interesting is that this social ethics created the Islamic world a sense of reliance of members of society in a way which you do not find here. When the time for prayers comes in Mecca, the bazaar right next to the Haram is the bazaar for selling gold. The women oftentimes go to Mecca to buy jewelry. Everybody goes to the prayers. You could walk through that bazaar and walk in front of every store and pick up thousand dollars and go put in your pocket and go to the next store. I've seen it many times in my eyes. And even in the poor parts of Islamic society, something of that remains. Of course, the impact of colonialism, of modernism, of intrusion of other elements has weakened that in big Islamic cities like Cairo, Tehran, Karachi. It's not like the old days. Uh, but even there, even there, the tradition of social ethics is to be felt to a large extent. And again here, individual ethics is very much related to social ethics, except one dimension. One dimension which is not very much mentioned by usual speakers about Islam these days, but it's very, very central. The question comes up, why be ethical? So because God wants us to be ethical. But what is, why does God want us to be ethical? Because he wants to perfect us. So ethics has to do with the possibility of perfection. And social ethics is support for human perfection. The goal of ethics is the inward cleansing and perfection. And that's where the spiritual disciplines of Islam, especially Sufism, come in. Is it accidental that every single important text of ethics in the Sunni world that is widely read was written by Sufis? Every single one. The Lion of Hyrene, uh, uh, written in Egypt. The Lion of Hyrene, excuse me, written in uh, the uh, prophet in Egypt. Uh, the books of Ghazali, the Qiyal of Medin, uh, all of these. Once uh, in front of Al Azhar University on purpose, and you know, they put books on the ground to sell in Cairo. I was walking with a friend, and I said, Look, I have this theory, and he was one of these people who was half Salafi and so forth, they really accepted the importance of Sufism. But he was a very ethical person. He said, look on the ground. And there were about a hundred Arabic books on the ground. The poor fellow was selling them out of the table. I'm sure they in the car and all that. In front of a mosque, they put the books on the ground. And uh, of course, there were a few more Anza and Hadith and Bukhari and so on inside. There were about 50 books of Islamic thought, and about 30 of them deal with ethics. Every single one was one of was by a Sufi. No person in this room who could not name a major treatise of Islamic ethics which is widely read, which was not either written by Sufi or inspired by Sufi. 
and the greatest ethical poems through which much of ethics was taught in the Islamic world, Persian to Persian, like me, Arab to someone, Arab, Turkish to someone, to all some of them, very, very rich in ethical poetry. They were all Sufi poems. <coughs> and look at the influence of Mala Jalal and Rumi on the ethical behavior of Turks and Persians. This is shared by these two parts of the song. Well, the Arabs didn't know Rumi very well until now, it's become popular thanks to uh, American translations or something like that. The other part of the song were over in India, some part of India. And I could give many, many other examples. And so in the field of ethics, again, in the visual relative society, a society provided an ethical support for the individual so that the individual could turn inward towards the inner life. Today, this is a very difficult thing to do, to try to follow the inner life in a society which does not have that support. is a very heroic task. Of course, it's always a heroic task. But we always have external support. And so when we talk about ethics, you should think of the most famous book of ethics in the Arabic language, Yahya al written by the great Ghazali, who was one of the greatest of Sufis. And you think of Shiazam, the greatest book of ethics in Shiazam. is a Mahajatul Beda, Yahya, Yahya, which is a Shiite form of the uh, Ghazali's book by uh, Faiz Kashani was also a famous Sufi and the Gnostic writer from Kashan, where my family hails from, the center of Iran. Now, let me turn, because my time is running out, uh, in fact, it's almost finished, a uh, few minutes left, uh, to the Kulut month. This, of course, is the most contentious. Uh, first of all, let me uh, ask the question, what type of government is Islamic? that would bind the individual and society in the, in the political world. To that answer, the answer to this question, in contrast to what could be a legal, or even economic, or social kind, there is no set answer to this question at the present moment in Islamic society. Islamic civilization went through four phases politically speaking. The short period of the Rashidun, the rightly guided caves, the first 30 centuries. Then the period of the classical caliphate, of the Umayyads and Abbasids in the eastern land of Islam, and the western Umayyads in Algeria and North Africa. Those others that claimed to be caliphates, they were not really caliphates. Then the third phase was the first phase of the conversion of the caliphate to sultanate. Monarchy. Of course, already in a sense, Muawiyah was a, like a monarch, but not exactly so. There's a big difference. Uh, and that begin was called Sultan in Arabic, in the word Sultan, which had dominion over, and uh, Sultan also, but of course, king is an English language, Sultan. And uh, it begins really from the Sajuk period, even within the caliphate, and it builds up. And the most extraordinary example of it is, of course, the Ottoman. Uh, caliphate, called Caliphate, the Sultanate that dominates over the Eastern Mediterranean world and much of North Africa, and the Persian uh, Empire of the Sultanate and the Mughal Sultanate in India, which were the last three great empires of the Islamic world before they were broken up and they became smaller units. But gradually, in the 20th century, as you know, after the colonialism, that period gradually began to change. We're still in the middle of that change from those. Uh, traditional institution of kingship and sultanate and so forth to, as you know, various forms of republic and uh, the Muslims have having a lot of trouble in even understanding what a republic is. Uh, of course, public in the Greek respublica, meaning the public realm, but the meaning he has gained in Western political thought, of course, is uh, what came out of the French Revolution, the decapitation of the French king, and the destruction of the monarchy, establishment of a rule in which the power would transfer from the body to the people. It's very, very significant. The most of the of some democracies were going there. Uh, in the classical theories, political theories of the West, we have the divine right of kings. Kings received the 
legitimacy from God. Now, this to various revolutions in the Western world, which took a long, long time, gradually changed, changed very, very gradually. Many people were killed, hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Many revolutions took place. And that gradually the power was taken out of the hands of God politically and put in the hands of the people. That is modern democracy, different from the dominant the Magna Carta, from the British democracy, the English democracy was first established. At that time, the English monarchs still had the one right of kings. The monarch and the monks of the people was only doing certain things. But as secularism set in into the West, gradually the laws of God over man were completely rejected and they were very main, the rule of the people. So, at that time, we brought up the old Latin adage, Vox populi, Vox Dei, that the voice of the people is the voice of God. And try to defend this as being not against the, the, the will of God, but the will of God is expressed through the people. But we know that this is not really the case in the Bible, as it was a classic case. Important to remember when you try to think of Islam is that this kind of secular democracy, a democracy in which the ultimate power, the legitimacy of political institutions, rests in the hand of the people. And the people are defined by historical accidents, whether a nation, a town, and what is it? What is the people? That itself is another story uh, that is very long and uh, as long as a lot of trouble coming to terms with modern nationalism, of course. But what's happening to Turkey? The Kurds in Turkey had no problem with the Ottoman period. Why don't you do they have Kurdish uprisings in 1890? Huh? Uh, there's a modern nationalism that, of course, brought those problems about. There are many things like that. I don't want to get into those. But this transformation was only possible if, if society were first secularized. <coughs> the Europeans had remained bound to Christianity as they were in the 1400. The French Revolution would not have taken place. You must understand that. The Muslims must understand that. Now, the Islamic world is not secularized like the France of 1800. Most people still believe very much in religion. Believe that ultimate hope from injunction of the law comes from God. And he's the ultimate ruler of the world. You know, the stickers that they have in America, Christ is king. That's good for a car sticker, but this king has no power as king in the United States, obviously. Whereas in the Muslim mind, God has not stopped ruling over the world. And that is why secular democracy has so much problem in the Islamic world. That's why the demands that the United States makes never come out. And that's why we have real democracy in the Islamic world beginning in the West against it. Because if you have real democracy, the voice of the people would be to allow the voice of God to rule over them. That's what's happening in Egypt now behind the scene machinations to prevent democracy from taking place. Just bring the name of Soleiman back and all that happened during the Mubarak regime. Who's supporting it? The army. Who's supporting the army? Who's paying the army? I don't have to say anything anymore. Uh, and this, you see that right before your eyes. Right before your eyes. And so in the Islamic world, not only is this difficult theological problem which Islam has to solve, but it's also combined with remarkable hypocrisy. Bahrain is treated one way, Saudi Arabia is treated one way, Syria is treated another way. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get into politics at this kind, but you don't have to be very perceptive to know what's going on. What's going on in Syria right now is the same script that we used in Iran in 1978. And we didn't turn Exactly the same script. Almost exactly the same book. They pulled it off the shelf and they're trying to apply it in a new uh, situation. Now, in a situation like that, the question of Islam and democracy, I think, is a mute question. Of course, all Muslims would like to be free. But they would like to be free to be Muslims. The idea of being free from religion is rare in Islam. The idea is to be free for religion. Many people in the West want to democracy, want to be free from any religious institution. Whereas in the Islamic world, most of the Islamic world were dominated by little minorities which were put in there by the colonial powers. And people want to be free from them. They don't want to be free from a 
the song. And the big bugbear that's been created about the Sharia, that uh, in religion always come and say, oh, we'll never have a law Sharia law to be promoted in the United States. As a Muslim, we wanted to have Sharia law promoted in the United States. I've said, when the Islamic law, the Americans should follow the Christian Sharia. Like the Christian law of an empire followed the Christian Sharia. In fact, it was called Sharia Masih Nasawiyah. Uh, the very word in Arabic was used as Christian Sharia. Not the Islamic Sharia, nobody's going to ask English to call Islamic Sharia. But the idea that this barber has been created is still one of the worst obstacles to understand what is really going on in the song. I want to conclude by just one sentence. A dear teacher of mine, you know, I've criticized Orientalism in a great deal, but I'm not like a word saying. I try to call a state a state. Orientalism has made many mistakes and also made great contributions. I know I myself as a humble scholar of the law to a very noble uh, British Orientalist, Sir Hamilton Gill, who's also a teacher of Dr. Wall here who's sitting there, and I have this in common. Uh, Sir Hamilton once said something wonderful. Somebody asked him in the class of Harvard, that was when he was a kindergarten of Harvard, <laughs> uh, before he started. Uh, Sir Hamilton, uh, what, what is Islamic democracy? Can Islamic democracy ever work? He said, there's only one correct Islamic form of government, and that is Islamic democracy, the rule of divine law. What form the government takes is secondary. That, that, that's a very, very profound statement. That is, Islamic society left to itself wants to have God's law promulgated so that the divine goes to heaven. They're is, is still believers. What form the government takes, that God on purpose is left in the hands of Muslims. That's why in the Quran, there's only one verse of Shawarm fil Amr, which is on every parliament uh, wall in the Islamic world, consulted in affairs of state. Doesn't give any indication of structures, political structures, at all. Much less than economic, much of the of inheritance of ethics, of eschatology, all the other things. Uh the doesn't talk about this. The Sunnah and the history and so on and so on, great institutions. And the Islamic world today is facing a daunting task of being disunited, part of Israeli uh, uh, set of treason against the rest of the Islamic world, public receiving money, <coughs> tremendous amount of wealth, and pressure from the outside, which the West never had. When America carried out its revolution against the British, was that a Chinese army in California pressing against the United States? And there were no Chinese submarines in the Gulf of Mexico. Whereas the Islamic world has to carry all of this with tremendous pressure from the West, which does not allow the inner dynamic of the Islamic world to manifest itself. But I, as a humble student of the Islamic world, and as a humble Muslim, I must admit to you, I hope, inshallah, I'm Muslim. Uh, I believe that these deeper structures, which are sought to clarify for you a little bit tonight, are going to win the day. They're finally going to win the day. All the Islamic world is weak. Most of its governments are terrible. They've sold their people for a few billion dollars at a few nice houses in Kent. Uh, nevertheless, Islam itself is a very powerful force in the Islamic world. And it's not becoming weaker. All the predictions made in the book Wither Islam, published in 1932, which Gibb published, in response to an earlier book by Zwemer, that predicted that in the middle of the 20th century there no Islam left. You know all of those are totally false. And I hope that in Congress like it that are held, in an atmosphere in which debate can be carried out openly, this is God's grace. We thank God and the American people to allow this possibility. But these issues are brought out more fully and clearly. Because if people like yourselves do not bring this out in America, the number of mistakes that are being, that are being made in this country, step by step, through either ignorance or will ignorance, through misinformation or disinformation, I do not know that, only God knows, so I don't want to get into that, will be tragic for everybody. Tragic for everybody. Whereas, if the Islamic world is allowed to have a normal, natural return to its own norms, I think we will not only be a benefit to the Islamic world, 
not only the, a benefit to the West, but to the whole of the world. And we certainly need that in this difficult age of human history. Thank you. Thank you. 